Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve sallallahu ve sellem ve baraka ala seyyidina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve ashabihi ecma'in. Allahümme alimna ma yenfa'una ve anfa'na bima alamtana. Ve seyyidina ilman ve amelan mutakabbelan ya arhamar rahimin. Allahümme la sahla illa ma ce'altahu sahla. Ve ente yahiyyu ya qiyyumu teca'alul hasna iza şi'te sahlan sahla. لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك اللهم ونتوب إليك وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه جمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to our class on أقيدة أب إمام الدردير رحمه الله تعالى we hope you're well and we hope you've watched the first lesson and those who watched the recordings we hope you're doing well and catching up as well in time for the lessons um, last time we discussed some introductory uh, points to Aqidah in itself, talked about the different groups and how they developed at the beginning of Islam and how Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the people of the Sunnah and the congregation or the Orthodox Muslims, how they are represented by the Ashari and Matuidi schools and a minority group called the Atharis, but not really very uh, well known or widespread. And then we also talked about the other groups. And some of the discussions as well to do with the book, the subject matter, the topic, the uh, the founders, the codifiers, the names of this science. And then we read through the actual uh, work itself of Imam al the Tawhidiyya, the Aqidah, that's written by Imam al which is here presented on three pages. Um, and three areas of study were the Ilahiyat or Divinity, Nubuwat, Prophethood, which is matching to Prophethood um, or matters relating to Prophethood. Um, and Sam'iyyat, which was the the unseen, the eschatology, the, the belief in the angels, the jinn, the unseen, the, the akhirah, and so forth. And then we mentioned finally a brief couple of points on Imam Dardir himself, Imam Ahmad Dardir, rahimahullah ta'ala, his teacher, students. One of his students, um, Ahmad uh, al Aqabawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, wrote a commentary on this poem, uh, on this, sorry, um, sorry Mustafa Aqabawi wrote a commentary which is extensively quoted in the commentary that we're going to be going through and he had other great students as well um, and we are now on um, the commentary so page 45 but before we start I just wanted to for those of you who haven't got the book yet just to show you the first page of contents to give you an idea of the kind of discussions that are coming up and those of you who got the book you'll have this page as well in the in in introduction or in the beginning of the contents um, so as you can make it out there it's the basmala so matters pertain to God or Ilahiyat. In the commentary, we're going to talk about the Basmala, the divine names of Allah, the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the supreme name, ar rahman ar rahim So they're talking about the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We're going to talk about Yajibu, it's wajib, so it's a necessary, al uh, mukallaf on the responsible person, Ma'rifatu, to know, so it says the necessity of knowing Allah and the role of revelation and reason, uh, a legally responsible person, who is the mukallaf? So it's wajib on the mukallaf, who is the Mukallaf, what do they mean by a responsible person? Um, and so forth. So we're going to go through those discussions, inshallah ta'ala, that you can see there, um, inshallah ta'ala. There's more, the, you know, there's several discussions. There's a, the contents page is about four or five pages. So there's plenty to discuss, which we'll talk about in the future, inshallah ta'ala. Um, so we'll make a start uh, on the first part, inshallah ta'ala, which is regarding um, the... Basmala. So the first part that we're going to be going through is is the basmala. We're going to be talking about the um, the the concept of the Bismillah. Basmala is Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So we're going to be talking about about this uh, now, inshallah uh, Taala. Um, so in terms of the basmala, it says the statement in the name of Allah, the Most Gracious, the Most Merciful, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. This is the basmala and sometimes called tasmiya. So if you if you've come across the word tasmiya for this, the basmala or tasmiya, this refers to the Bismillah Rahman Rahim. And what Imam or what the author here does in terms of commentary on that. So Imam Tardirus wrote Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Yajibu al Mukallaf. Now he just made the text. We're going through the commentary as well. Um so what um the commentator he talks about, which is what all the commentators talk about when we go into a traditional work. They talk about the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. They talk about Alhamdulillah. They talk about the Rushri Salawat upon the Prophet These are the introductory remarks to most books and works. So they talk about the meanings of these things. 
Um, and in terms of Bismillah Rahman Rahim, the Bismillah is mentioned first because of Hadith. First of all, the Prophet said in many Hadith, uh, somewhat weak Hadith, but combined together, scholars have said they're good Hadith, um, that Kullu Amrin Dibal, every affair of importance, La Yubda'u, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, that is not begun with, is not initiated with Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Fahuwa Abtar. Fahuwa abtar is cut off, eye of blessings, ajidham in some reports. Um, different words to mean cut off or severed, you know, it means he is severed. Um, eye from blessings, from goodness. Even in that, not mentioning the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you begin something takes away the true blessings and productivity and fruits from that um, task, from that endeavor, whether it's eating food, whether it's studying, whether it's helping someone, whether it's, you know, a good act, a kul amr in dibal, right? An act of importance of. Something that's important and it has to, has to do, um, and in the next page, page forty six, uh, in the commentary mentioned just at the beginning there of Sheikh Mustafa Al Aqabawi, rahimahullah taala, he quotes uh, a, a narration regarding the Basmala in his book, and he says um, that the first thing the pen wrote, the qalam, the, the created, Allah created the law and the qalam. The first thing the qalam, the pen wrote on the tablet, on the preserved tablet was. Bismillah, Rabbil Rahma, right? In the name of Allah, the Lord of Mercy. Bismillah, in the name of Allah, uh, Rabbil Rahma, the Lord of of Mercy. Subhanahu uh, wa Taala. And the uh, Bismillah, in the name of Allah, the Lord of Mercy, and the Giver of Mercy. Um, verily, I am Allah, there is no God but me, and Muhammad Sallallahu is my messenger. Whoever submits to my decree, remains patient over my trials, is thankful for my blessings, and content with my judgment, then I consider him utmost veracious, and will raise him with the utmost veracious ones. I consider him a Siddiq, and I will raise him amongst the, the Siddiqun. Right? So this is a great rank for those who follow the, those guidance who believe in Allah his messenger who are patient with the decree of Allah who are thankful for the blessings they are given and content with what has been apportioned to them then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will consider that to be a Siddiq the highest rank after the prophets alayhim wa salatu wa salam is Siddiq Siddiqiyya and to be a Siddiq or a Siddiqah um, and say that Maryam was of this rank wa ummuhu Siddiqah the mother, mother of Isa al-Islam was of the highest rank of this veracious it's a rank of being true and sincere in one's iman, in one's actions uh, with Allah subhanahu uh, wa ta'ala in your... Because ultimately everything we do is connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's, it's an interaction with Allah. It's a um, a transaction like, you know, we, we go around and we buy things and we interact with people and, you know, we're responsible for things. Everything in ultimate reality is either we're giving and taking for the sake of we are giving take for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when we realize that and we behave with this consciousness and awareness and therefore we do everything imagine you're dealing with Allah in everything you be careful you be upright you be have full etiquette you have awe and reverence if you can bring that into your daily life then you have reached a level of constantly being in that state you level you reach a level of siddiqiyya you reach a level of great um of righteousness sincerity and connection to Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so that's that's the first sort of point mentioned that Bismillah brings blessing. And also, although Alhamdulillah is not mentioned in this text because it's a very short text and it's Bismillah Yajibu, uh, Alhamdulillah has similar narrations with it regarding starting something, not start something. So they say Alhamdulillah because if you don't say Alhamdulillah, it will cut off the blessings as well. So Alhamdulillah is important to say um, at the beginning. And of course, Salawat upon the Prophet وسلم, is important to say as well. That also brings blessings and it's common tradition. When we make du'as, when we do things, to start with the um, the remembrance of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, uh, and then salutations upon His Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa ala alihi wa So it's uh, it's important to 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 make the most um, of our uh, dhikr and you know to not 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 miss out on the blessings really. Um, and then it moves on to the name of Allah definition derivation, a very a very short section on the name of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Um, the definition and derivation. So, to summarize this next part, the name of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is divinely revealed. It wasn't something that the Arabs themselves or you know we 
understood to be the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was given by Allah as his name. Uh, and this is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this language. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the Arabic language for his name. A uh, yes, name was there before. You know, people would say Allah. It's not unknown. It's not an unknown word. But it is the name for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and anything else is a, a translation in a sense. And you don't translate names, to be honest, do you? My name is Wasim, which means like good looking or whatever. You don't translate, you don't call me, hey, good looking. Or somebody's called Kareem, noble. You say, oh, noble's over there. You know, somebody's called Jameel. You don't say, oh, beautiful's over there. Somebody's called, you know, uh, Rahim, merciful. You don't say, oh, you use their name. So for in reality, we should not need to translate this name. It's the name of Allah. What does it mean though? What does names have meanings? And of course, the, the word Allah has a meaning. And this is what Imam Bajuri here mentions. It's a proper name. So it's a, it's a name of Allah, it's the actual naming word, like a specific person, is. you have a proper name, like name of people, name of places. For a being whose existence is necessary and is deserving of all praise. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the name of the creator of this universe, the necessary being that was never um, in non-existence, always was existent, has always been necessarily existent, and is deserving of all praise for what he does, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's Allah. And what they say, as he mentions there uh, by Imam Ghazali and others, is the name Allah, although we don't understand it because of a lack of our knowledge and experience and you know learning, but the name Allah itself contains all the meanings, all the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So within the name Allah is Ar-Rahim, Ar-Rahman, Al-Ghafoor, Al-Shakoor, Al-Latif, Al-Khabir, Al-Adl, Al-Hakam, Al-Dar, Al-Nafi, Al-Muhi, Al-Mumit. If we understood the meaning of the name of Allah and who Allah is, we, you know, the name Allah contains all of that. All of those attributes within, um, within when we say Allah, it's not deficient of or lacking of, or it's not you know it doesn't have any of that missing from it. Whereas when you say Al Latif, it's Al Latif, it's a specific characteristic, not a specific attribute. When you say Al Qadir, it's Qudra, it's the power of Allah. When you say Al Alim, it's the knowledge of Allah. When you say Allah, it's everything, and that's what this name is. It's the all-encompassing name um, of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the Creator Subhanahu wa Taala. Um, and also to mention it's not de actually derived some words are derived like Rahim is from Rahma and they derive and that's fine you know, the word Rahim means somebody who shows immense mercy some words are not derived and they're just words as found and this was a word as it is Allah and some have said it's Al and Ilah and they made Al Ilah Allah but the majority opinion is just a word in itself Allah and it's the name of the one and true creator uh, and worthy, one worthy of worship Subhanahu wa ta'ala um, So this is uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his name Allah And then the next section talks about the concept of the supreme name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala The ismul a'zam Ismullahi al-a'zam The greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So what is this greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what we're talking about In the hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in, As quoted here if you, if you, regarding this name of Allah, if used when supplicant Allah, He answers, and if used to ask, He bestows. If you use the name of Great Name of Allah to seek protection, you are granted protection from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Um, so, because of this hadith, um, and what the Prophet said, the Sahaba and the Ulama ever since have debated what is the greatest name. Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala many and the majority opinions are it is the name Allah Allah is the greatest name and through this name if you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you'll be given Allah is the greatest name Ismullah al-A'zam is Allah others have said it's in Ayat al-Kursi because it's been mentioned Allahu la ilaha illa al hayl qayyum in hadith that in Ayat al-Kursi is contained the greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so al hayl al qayyum together is one opinion is regarded as the greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, one opinion, which is actually between Imam Hanifa, which is similar to his opinion regarding the Laylatul Qadr, is that it's not a fixed night and it's not a fixed name. The greatest name of Allah changes according to circumstance. And knowing what name to use at that time is knowing the name, the greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we, we, we don't know it changes, right? So it could be one at this time and then Allah wants you to call upon him with this at different times. Only Allah knows. This is the opinion of Imam Hanifa that it changes. Um, and 
They are mentioned, many mentioned, plenty mentioned over the page of page 48. So, who? Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al hayyul qayyum. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. The word who means he is, or that's the name of Allah. Al hayyul qayyum was the opinion of Imam Nawawi. Dhul Jalali wal Ikram. He mentioned in the letters, mentioned at the start of certain chapters, such as Hamin, Ain Sin, Qaf. It is unknown to creation. Um, and then it moves on to the section on who had the knowledge of the greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and two people in the Quran not mentioned by name but their actions are mentioned and who they were were mentioned uh, and their good traits and bad traits one of them turned out to be bad uh, the first one his name was Bil'um ibn Ba'ura who was from the Bani Israel from the time of Musa alayhi salam um, and he was given a lot of openings you know, he was a great man worshipped pious and he had the greatest name of Allah and he'd make du'as but he fell off the path. He made mistakes and he strayed. Allah says regarding him, tell them the story of the man to whom we gave our messages. He sloughed them off. No Satan took him as his follower and he went astray. Um, the scholar differs with regards to this person whom Allah gave his messages to and the majority said it is the specific pers- a specific person and thus it was said it is Bal'um ibn Ba'ura or Bil'am. He was a man from the Canaanites who had been given some of the books of Allah. It is said that he had knowledge of the supreme name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also it's Asif al barkhiya which was at the time of Sulaiman alayhi salam, the one who brought the throne to him. He's, the jinn said, we'll bring it before, you know, um, uh, we'll bring it really quick. He said, I'll bring it to you before you get out of your seat. No, before you do anything, it'll be in front of you, right? Um, so that the ayah is there. It says Allah says, and then He said, counselors. Uh, then He said, I, Sulaiman Islam, counselors, which of you can bring me her throne before they come to me in submission? So He called the Queen of Sheba, Saba, and invited them, and they were coming. So He said, look, bring her throne. You know the story is famous. Uh, so then she'll think, wait, wait a minute, my throne was in my land. How did it get here? So you know, do this miracle. Um, a strong and crafty jinn, ifritum min al jinn, ifrit. With the Ain or the strong jinn, powerful jinn. I will bring it to to you before you can rise from your place. So he said, before you rise from your place, before you stand up, قبل أن تقوم من مقامك. I am strong and trustworthy enough. Right? And, you, and this is a, 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 actually an ayah which uh, indicates that we should come forward for jobs and volunteer and give our time and and put out forward our skills. And you can not not necessarily praise yourself because you don't want to boast, boast and stuff, but to mention your um, qualifications as to why you're the worthy person in order to fill an obligation because look, when people ask for help and this is you know maybe a call for help in some ways from for everyone out there please look you know go and volunteer for some local organization but when people ask for help and volunteers they want the right skills to come forward somebody who knows the field can do the job much more efficiently uh, time saving money saving much more professionally quality increases and that's why we need to sometimes say, look, give me this job because I can do it. I do it for a living. I can do it a lot better than other people. You don't have to say it in, a neg- in an arrogant way, but in a in a wise way to show that you're the one worthy of this role. And this Yusuf al-Islam did the same thing. So one example he is of this. Yusuf al-Islam, when he was freed from jail, went on a bit of a tangent, but it's a good point to make. Uh, he came out of jail and they wanted to honor Yusuf al-Islam. You know, they said to Yusuf al-Islam, you know, the, the king at the time of Egypt, etc., you know, you're, we want to bring you close to us and bring you as part of our kind of, you know, courtiers, government, etc. And he said, put me in charge of the khaza'in al-ard, the resources, you know, the, the treasuries. Inni hafizun alim. I am the one who preserves and looks after and I know a lot, I know. So he mentioned again two characteristics here. Uh, trustworthy, strong, qawiyun, uh, uh, and you know, I can't remember the other word in Arabic, trustworthy, Amin as well. Um, but he, you know, similarly, Yusuf Islam, he's not boasting like I've got these characteristics, but he's telling them, look, I need to be in charge of this because I know the dream. I know how to look after these resources. So tomorrow we don't get, we don't lose out. I mean, we're not in trouble tomorrow, right? We don't wait, squander things because people don't know what they're doing. I often make uh, mistakes. You know, mismanagement is common because people are not qualified to manage certain areas and certain things. So again, if you have the skills, put them forward. If you're not accepted and if people don't listen to you, that's tough and that's life. But you should go forward. And put your and wisely put your skills forward uh, to make things better and to do things in the right way. But then it says carrying on. So the jinn said this, you know, I can do this. I'm I'm worthy of this. But one of them who had some knowledge of the scripture said, "I will bring it to you in the twinkling of an eye." And it's one of the people, not the jinn. And he did so. And this person, his name was it said his name was Asif. 
uh, al barqi or Ibn Barqi, yeah, it says they are very experienced with regards to the identity of the person that the, uh, that was given knowledge of the scripture mentioned in the above verse. According to the majority of the scholars, it was a very righteous and pious man named Asaf, the son of Barqiya, the scribe of the Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam. And these are tafsir, and you can look at the tafsir of the Quran. But these were two people mentioned as having special knowledge that Dua allowed him, that name Allah allowed him to bring the throne of, and he did so, he brought the throne, the Quran tells us that, uh, of the queen of Sheba in an instant. and. You know, it placed it. They, they changed it as well, and the the story continues and how she became a Muslim. Uh, there's another. There's a story of um, uh, this is mentioned by Imam Al Qushayri, rahimahullah in his Risal Al Qushayriya, um, in the biographies, uh, biographies of some of the the great awliya and scholars and so forth. Can't remember which one it was, but the story I remember was of and you know maybe some of you are thinking this: What is the greatest name of Allah, and how do you get it? And you know, I wish I could use it. Um, so one great Sheikh, I think he was in Baghdad. His student asked him, you know, teach, and he knew the greatest name of Allah, he was a pious man. And his student asked him, could you um, teach me and give me this greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that I can make du'as and I can do good and so forth. So he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't give him. So he goes, look, please, you know, test me, do what you want. Please, I'm, you know, I'm asking you, uh, you're a great, I know, I love you, we respect you. So his sheikh said, okay, you know, teacher said, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead with this. So he goes, but you gotta do something for me first, right? And there's always a you know a means to an end. Because what do I have to do? He goes, deliver this parcel to somebody in another city. I can't remember what city it was, but let's say Kufa, um, you know, another city, uh, several uh, days journey away from the city they're in. And once you've delivered it, give it and come back, and that's it. That's all you got to do. You don't have to do anything else. And it's so and so, and he gave him all the details. So he said, fantastic. But it was one condition. But what's the condition? He goes, you can't open the parcel. So you can't open and look inside or anything. You've just got to deliver it, leave it there and come back. Right? He goes, okay, that's not a problem. So he took this small parcel. He was like curious, you know, curiosity killed the cat. He was really curious and he was like, okay, on the way, on the way. As he's going on the journey, you know, quite a distance into his journey, you see, he hears movement in this box. So he's like listening now. What's going on? I can hear something inside. And then he hears like, he, and he hears like, you know, it's actually forceful movement, not just sounds. He's things like, what's going on in here? What's in here? better check it right and what does he do he opens it up and what does he find he finds a mouse <laughs> finds a mouse inside he's like instead of thinking he's broken the condition or he's you know breached it, the terms he thinks to himself what on earth is the sheikh doing to me giving me a little mouse to take to somebody so far away and come back that's like a waste of my time and what is this mouse you know just halas right there was nothing special about the mouse by the way so he decides to give up on the journey and come back. You know, he's you know he's rather than go and waste all this time delivering a mouse to some random person over you know in the another city miles away. So he heads back and he's quite upset as well at all this kind of this episode. So he goes to the sheikh and the sheikh said, "Oh, you're back quick. What happened?" You know, and the sheikh obviously knew what happened, but he was obviously wanting him to teach him a lesson. So he said, "Oh, sheikh, you know, with respect, uh, I found it a bit disappointing that you gave me a mouse to deliver." So uh, I, you know, I, I ended up opening it because it was moving and stuff, and I saw it. And I'm sorry, but I just came back. I couldn't go all this way to deliver a mouse. So what was the point of that? Um, so the sheikh replied, "You see, if I can't trust you with the little mouse, how can I trust you with the greatest name of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala? If you couldn't even fulfill this trust of delivering a parcel, regardless of what it contained." And I can trust you to that level. Then how do I know when I give you the greatest name of Allah to make all these du'as, what on earth you're going to be asking for, what on earth you're going to be doing with that name? So what they actually say is whoever has access to the greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how to use it and understands the, the creation of Allah as a wisdom and wouldn't make du'a to remove, for instance, oh Allah, by your greatest name, remove all illnesses. You know, somebody has the greatest name of Allah, wouldn't even make that du'a because that's not a du'a that befits the reality of this world. Of course, we want relief for an individual. Maybe for an individual, yes. But to remove all diseases and all worries and make everybody this, that, the other and no, uh, you know, no, no problems. That's not how the world works. And that's not the du'as we need to ask for. We ask for relief for all people in general. Yes, we do. And you know what, what that means is we ask them to get through their difficulties with their iman intact, with their iman increasing and strengthening. Because that's the goal. And that's the du'as these people will make. The greatest in the name of Allah is used for improving our iman, for for you know, strengthening ourselves and becoming greater Muslims and greater people, and not just having a, a you know really good or what we'd call like a a nice um, you know a smooth life without any difficulties or worries or this that. Yeah, that's part of life. We talked about this before. That you know life has its ups and downs, and we need to accept them and grow through them. Inshallah, Taala. 
And then it continues talking about the Bismillah. So it's Bismillah. Allah was the first word we talked about. Then it moves on to Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. So the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two names that signify and talk about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Both are derived from Rahma. Rahma is uh, mercy, kindness. And um, this is the beginning of our book, the book of Allah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is the beginning of everything we do as Muslims. So this is something important to note that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us from his mercy and it's out of mercy he created us you know he gave us life because he wanted to be kind to us it's not a punishment it's not a uh, you know uh, some kind of you know you know like barbaric act of creation for us or being here no Allah's intention Allah's will is to have sure mercy uh, and to you know create us for kindness and for well-being uh, and for goodness, ultimately, you know, obviously there's a learning process in that, there's stages in that, you know, there's a lot to talk about regarding that. Um, so Allah mentions not just one name of his mercy, but two when he begins his book, when he, we as Muslims are taught to begin anything. Bismillah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. So what's the difference between them, as mentioned here? His Ar-Rahman is the one that gives the general blessing. So everybody has life, everybody has you know, um, uh, limbs, everybody has, you know, uh, well, most people have limbs, right? Everybody has, um, most people have, you know, it comes down to this, like, you know, the general blessings of, you know, you can breathe, you have most of your limbs, you, and you have all your limbs, alhamdulillah, uh, you know, you have family, like I said, with, you know, not every single person has everything, you have housing and so forth, in general, right? But there's specific blessings, very, very minute blessings that, um, Allah gives that his Rahim. So Rahman is for general blessings and Rahim is for specific blessings. So Allah SWT has given you specifically and you know kind to you as being in you knowledge, special knowledge. That, that's his being Rahim towards you. His father has made certain pu- pu- uh, people and, and creation extremely beautiful. Right? So you look at certain things in life and think, SubhanAllah, look at the beauty of that or this person is beautiful. You know, that's Allah's creation, right? That's the creation of Allah SWT, his specific blessings. Um, to certain things, um, you know, some people may have certain abilities, and some people may have been given certain, um, and within ourselves, actually, that the, Allah is a Rahim, and we look at how our eyes work. Allah is a Rahim, and we look how our bodies work, and our immune systems, and our, uh, you know, how water is needed, and so forth. And we think, Subhanallah, look how all of that is so detailed and minute, and you know, such a balance is within this human body. It's amazing, you know. When you study those of you asked the human body and anatomy and you know medicine, you. It's, it's mind blowing how amazing this 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 thing we have right that we walk around with and we say you know use every single day of our lives is an amazing creation of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Allah us to reflect on that. Wafi anfusikum and do you not see in yourselves? Afalatu basirun and look into yourselves for many many signs. The signs the skies, the signs in the seas in in, in the land, the signs within ourselves for a belief in Allah, for a Creator, for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Um, Another uh, difference mentioned by some of the chronic commentators when they talk about Bismillah at the beginning of the Quran is that Ar-Rahman is for everyone that Allah created us, Allah gave us life, opportunity and Ar-Rahim is for the believers. So Ar-Rahman is the mercy that encompasses all creation and there's extra mercy, special mercy, kindness for the believers i.e. the intercession they'll receive, the paradise they'll receive, the forgiveness. This is a special uh, Rahma which is Ar-Rahim. Allah is the one who's specifically merciful to um, his believing servants um, and this is an important uh, this, uh, d- you know, difference as well which is um, the Ar-Rahman is only for Allah so nobody else can be called um, Ar-Rahman you can't call this is Ar-Rahman or anybody like that it's Abdul Rahman yes but Rahman is a name just like Allah is only for Allah so is Ar-Rahman can never be used for any creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we can say to somebody uh, Abdul Rahman or Amatul Rahman, Abdul Rahman for men and Amatul Rahman for women or male and female, and you can, uh, however, on the other hand, you can use a Rahim for anybody. So for Allah, it's different. It's not the same. Allah's attributes may share. We may share names with Allah, but not meanings. Allah's Rahmah is not anything like a human mercy, by the way, right? And we talk about this as we get into the book. Um, but you can call somebody Rahim. So had the Rajulun Rahim, and this is a, a merciful man, right? Uh, the Prophet ﷺ is Ar-Ra'ufur Rahim, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right. So some names of Allah can be named, words can be shared, but the meanings are different. 
and Rahim, the mercy that we have at a creation level, is described with the attribute Rahim, not Allah's attribute, just the word in language, it's Ar Rahim. So um, it shows you that Rahman is specific, and that's the ruling, by the way. Nobody should call themselves, we should never call somebody Rahman. Uh, always say Abdul Rahman, right? You know, I know people in certain traditions they say Haji Rahman or Rahman, this Rahman. You should be with Abdul Rahman, nobody should be called Rahman except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, Musaylim al kadhab called himself Rahman. He wanted to pick a name that was unique to you know, created, uh, the Creator. So he called himself, I think, Rahman al Yamama. Yamama. He was destroyed and killed the false prophet. Uh, but he called himself Rahman. I wanted to single it out that he is that. Astaghfirullah. I mean, just horrible to even think that. So we shouldn't be using names which are specific and unique to Allah alone uh, for the creation. Another one named like that is As Samad. Allah is Samad. As Samad is only for Allah. So somebody is called Abdul Samad. You should never be called Samad. Samad is here. No, As Samad is only for Allah. And Abdul Samad and Amatus Samad is for the creation, the servants of As Samad. Right? So this is important. There are certain names that you know we need to be careful of. If we name somebody with them, they have the prefix Abd. Abd means slave of. And Allah means Allah. Ar Rahman means the merciful. As Samad means the uh, uh, independent of the absolute, the free of need, and so forth. And then we move into the, the first part of the text, which is. Um, يجب على المكلف معرفة ما يجب لله ولأنبيائه ولملائكة الكرام. It is necessary upon the mukallaf. This word is used for the legally responsible person on page fifty one. Um, is there in brackets for you mukallaf to know معرفة to so to have معرفة. This word. What does it mean? We're going to talk about insha Allah. Uh, what is يجب لله? What is necessary for Allah, um, the Almighty, His prophets and biya and His noble angels. So we're going to learn about the attributes that are necessary for Allah, His prophets and His angels. And we're going to learn what we mean by necessary here as well. And we're going to learn about what we mean first of all by ma'rifa or knowledge or awareness and knowing um, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it says knowledge of Allah, that is of His attributes and existence and actions as well, what He does, is necessary as stated by Imam Dardir. So we have this obligation, necessary means obligation, right, fard. Yajibu here, although it's the word wajib in Arabic, is meaning here, as in the intent and purpose of Yajibu here is fard, right? It's an obligation, just like it's obligation to pray five times a day. It's an obligation to learn about Allah and know His attributes and His uh, actions um, without any dispute. So there's no nobody, uh, you know, has suggested a kid studying the basic the basic level of a kid knowing about Allah is recommended or uh, sunnah is absolutely essential. It actually takes precedence over actions because no action is worth anything without belief, right? Without iman, and iman entails a level of knowledge about Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So learning about Allah, knowing about Allah, is absolutely essential for any believer. It says, "What is disputed on the topic of discussion between the theologians? However, are the questions who made it necessary? So, how when did it become necessary? Who made it necessary? How was this ruling discovered, and what is the role of scripture and intellect in the regard? Right? Um, so." What we're talking about here is, first of all, Allah made it necessary, right? فَعْلَمَ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ It's in the Qur'an itself. Uh, however, however, there is an opinion, which is what it's referring to here, that even if there was no revelation, would we still need to believe in God Almighty? That's the question being posed amongst the theologians. Um, and they all differed. The um, traditional scholars said, no, if Allah doesn't reveal anything to us, then there's no obligation. So it's, it's Allah that makes you obligatory. Hence why I put that first as a remark that it's Allah who makes you obligatory. That's what we believe. So that means somebody, whether it's in the past nations and people, or in this day and age, which is very rare, but it could be the case for people in remote areas, who've never heard about Allah, never heard about a revelation, right? Because we think Allah makes it obligatory. That means through his prophets, revelation. Then they are not accountable. That's what that opinion entails. And that's, the predominant opinion amongst the Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, the most common and widespread opinion, that it is a revelation. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبَعَثَ رَسُولًا And we weren't to punish until we sent a messenger. So until we send a, a, a messenger, a Rasul, um, we're not going to be مُعَذِّبِينَ, we're not going to punish. So there's no accountability without a message, without some form of warning. Right? If Allah warns and prophets were sent, and the prophets sent Bashiran wa Nadira. He, as a, a warner and a giver of glad tidings. So where's this This needs to be given for there to be accountability. The Mu'tazilites, we mentioned before as well, 
um, they said is purely on the intellect. The fact that we've been created with uh, the faculty to reason, to think, rationale, this necessitates and therefore we're accountable and will be punished for not believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though we have not received any revelation, we are accountable by virtue of intellect alone, not by virtue of revelation, just by due to the fact of knowing or having the ability. So anybody who doesn't have intellect, then he's excused. So what makes it obligatory is aql, intellect. So there are people that don't have, you know, the mental faculty of thinking and reasoning. So, okay, such people are ill, Ill people, let's say, and they have these illnesses and this, these conditions. They're not accountable. That's what the Mu'tazilite said. That's, that's that level. Um, and they said that revelation comes to support and aid and confirm what the aql, the, the intellect, already has, you know, a role to play. And as you can see, we talked about this last time, they gave that major role to the intellect and reason uh, above the, above scripture as you can see uh, because they had a principle where it is the mind the aql the reason that decides ultimately what is good and bad very very problematic approach which is more of a you know philosophical approach philosophy and the philosophers and so forth and and modern thinking even modernism etc it's all about what we regard relativism right everybody what they regard as good and bad and you know it le leads to that they didn't necessarily do that but it can lead to that because you're opening the door for the, the human mind to decide whereas the everyone else said look Allah defines good and bad Allah defines who's accountable not accountable it's a revelation uh, that Allah states in we we take first um, there is a slight contrast amongst the Asharis and Maturidi so the Asharis were on this opinion that it's only with revelation the Maturidis had a slight um, so of some of them, not all of them as well, some of them had a slight in-between kind of reasoning between um, the Mu'tazilites and the Asharis. What they said was that um, you have to believe in a creator by way of the Aql as well. So similar to the um, uh, Mu'tazilites, okay? But by... We should read this actually, it'd be good to read this. It says, in slight contrast, the Maturis believe that the necessity of having a faith in a creator and his necessary attributes, which we're going to talk about, can be known solely through the process of reasoning. Their belief is that the one who has made it necessary is Allah. So they're saying it's Allah, not reason. But by way of reason, so he's given you the faculty, he's given you the ability. So it's Allah ultimately that's made it obligatory. Similarly to how Allah made certain things lawful and unlawful but through the Messenger of Allah وسلم, in essence reason according to their understanding is a tool that has the capacity to know and reveal certain divine rulings and therefore in contrast to the Asharis if Allah did not send any messengers reason can still be applied to know of the existence uh, uh, of the existence of God by way of signs in creation uh, that indicate towards his existence. Al-Bayadi states in Isharat al-Maram a text on uh, Maturidi doctrine he says, by the more present, the mere presence of reason during the period of deduction, it is necessary to have knowledge of His, the Almighty's existence, His oneness, His omniscience, His omnipotence, His speech, He will and His will and the contingency of the universe, right? Um, but this is the important point that they don't say that we give reason the the role like the Mu'tazilites. They say Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is the one who decides what is good and bad, Allah SWT decides whether we are accountable or not. So ultimately they even left this to Allah. But they believed, their opinion was that somebody will be accountable by Allah if Allah has given them reason to think and to reflect and they have to come to, so they have to come to the few basic uh, ruling uh, beliefs, which is one that there's a creator, two that there's only one creator, and you know, three, four, five that he's got will, power, knowledge, right? These are the basics that we should all be able to deduce from our surroundings. We don't have to know that Allah SWT is X, Y, Z, the stories of the prophets or know our other beliefs or just by way of reason. So outside of Islam, let's say, will people be accountable who have not received a message? According to the Asharis, nobody. According to the Maturidis, yes, those who have intellect and don't come to these conclusions. According to the Mu'tazilites, what's the difference between them? They they even they even add on more than just the basic beliefs. They even say that a person should know that you know this is wrong and you'll be accountable for sins and so forth. Uh, so you know sinning and not doing good to your neighbor, not doing X Y Z. Um, these are sins that they'll be accountable for. The Matris didn't say that. The Matris said, look, to know what's right and wrong it requires revelation, and that ultimately defines it, and that's what it's based upon. The morality comes from revelation, and that is not accountable for without revelation. So they agreed to that with the Asharis. But then they said, look, what you can 
deduct, there's a bit creator, and that is an accountability. Um, but ultimately, it is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not within, within our, we don't judge who goes to heaven and hell. So it's like more of a dunya, you know, in the world, what do we believe, what do we, our opinion. These were the opinions given on um, knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowing Allah here means knowing his essential attributes, which are the ones we're going to be going through. Knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here means knowing him in terms of a basic level that you know that what we just said there that this creation indicates to a creator that's it if somebody can say that and articulate that that's the proof that they're talking about knowing him how so we had the questions um how is this ruling discovered and what is the role of scripture and intellect in that regard right um so this is the the different opinion on this um then this is the legal response person so it's, it's wajib or a obligation on the mukallaf who is the mukallaf who is the one that has to believe who is obligated to believe the legal responsible person uh, there are four conditions mentioned here and these are very the famous uh, four conditions um, of the uh, ulama um, over the next few pages so one and two are straightforward it says number one sanity so everybody agrees that without uh, intellect there's no accountability um, number two adult so balik so you reach adulthood not a child so a child of six seven eight even ten may have aql and intellect and can know things and even believe in God, yes, but there's no accountability to believe at this moment. There's no, if the person is not legally responsible for believing in the tenets of faith and practicing Islam or anything until they reach adulthood. Of course, before then, the whole idea is to teach them, prepare them, ready them, educate them. So when they hit puberty, when they hit adulthood, they're ready to do everything. Unfortunately, we delay until that time, then we start teaching them or we even don't teach them at that time so they don't really know what to do so Islam becomes a secondary factor in life and our Iman is weak and we have to struggle to find Iman in our adult life and then you know we're struggling in our 20s and 30s to find some kind of uh, serenity and peace in, in our beliefs in our 40s and it's a struggle for a lot of people and this is why we need to be kind of considerate to others around us right people around us just because they're not practicing Muslims they're on a journey um, and you know they might come around in in five ten years time and you will be patient with them we want them to be on iman in five ten years time so look at it as a long-term journey you know, i don't think right not muslims now or not practicing muslims now let's put the hammer down that hammer now could scare them off even more um so we've got to be wise you know this is how it is unfortunately but going back to the point adults are required if you're adult you you met the second condition sanity adulthood um uh, but obviously if uh, there is differences maybe and it says he yeah, according to my trees however the cognizant and the sunny child is responsible like an adult due to having an intellect so this wanted the intellect that that then comes into the equation uh, but important more importantly the receiving of divine teachings right and this is the majority opinion like we said that it's not just the intellect alone it's the the fact and it's always what's quoted and taught right in this book we have mentioned the opinions but really what's always taught and mentioned is there must be revelation there must be a message not just revelation there must be that revelation has reached the the person so everyone's in an individual has a message reached to you it could be either that be by the messenger or it could be via the sahaba via his companions via the future generations of that religion and once that message has been made clear and you know there's no doubts left in it and you're, you've had a you know a, a clear elucidation of beliefs in god and you've been you've been reflecting over that and thinking and you decide to reject that disbelief you know you're accountable uh, after having known and received the message right but there is a problem we have, and a problem a lot today, a big, big problem today. And that is, what if you don't get the correct message? What if you get a distorted message? What if you get of the truth? So somebody's take, totally telling you this is Islam, but it's actually lies against Islam, which, like I said, is, is, is common today. It says here, it is important to know that if divine teachings have reached a person but in a distorted manner, then according to the more correct opinion, they are not obliged to believe, and they will not be punished for their disbelief. So if somebody says, you know, Islam is these barbaric people, they'll blow themselves up, and they lock up their women and they just want to cause havoc in the world they're not safe to be around do you want to be a muslim nope well i don't think anybody want to be that what you described so the answer is definitely going to be a no for anybody with the same mind okay well you've just given a distorted image can somebody be held accountable for that right and that doesn't mean that really what, what it means here is look if a, if a muslim goes to a non-muslim a genuine muslim but has bad characteristics has immoral behavior, is, you know, extremist in some way and is radicalized and this, that, the other. And, and you know, a non-Muslim in, in, in interacts with actually a Muslim, obviously a bad Muslim, and that non-Muslim develops a misunderstanding of Islam. Are they now accountable or not? Because they've been exposed to Islam in a false way. It's not Islam, it's a Muslim practicing 
an un Islamic, non Islamic thing. So, how can that be Islam, right? So, this is a discussion that ulama had. Some said, look, it's, now it's the duty of that person to do the research into Islam because the door's been opened. And is, it, is this really Islam? What do Muslims believe? Right? You, before you criticize, you should study a subject and you should look into it before you start making judgments. And people have done this, by the way, and it's led them to Islam, which is amazing, right? So, they've come out wanting to attack Islam and Muslims because of what they see of this barbaric and backward in their eyes nature in their eyes of course and after researching and you know looking into things they become Muslim so this is you know is, are they accountable now because if some people have become Muslim through that negative interaction the first interaction was negative they become Muslims then what about the rest of them are they not accountable shouldn't they be doing what this person isn't that the purpose of life isn't that an accountability now they've received a message it's a big discussion a very in-depth discussion uh, and this, the book being written about this by Imam Ghazali it's called Faisal al-Tafriqa um, and I believe it's been translated um, I don't know who or when or what, but I, I have heard from another fellow colleague teacher that it was translated. Um, and it's a book to, to, to read if you want to know more about this subject and what Imam Ghazali had to say about the distorted message and whether people are accountable or not and what we should... I mean, ultimately, again, whether we say they're accountable or not, only Allah knows if they are. But it's good to know because it does help in other ways. And then it says uh, the people of primordiality. So the people of primordiality... Uh, Fitrah, who lived before the coming of the Messenger, or the time of the Messenger, was not sent to them. According to the Mokhrat opinion, will not enter um, hellfire, even if they were she worshipped within Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So yeah, so on the, based on their opinion, and this is the majority, that divine teachings have to reach a person, then they're not accountable. So what if they were committing shirk? What if they were doing evils? Then they're not accountable. Then they will be forgiven if they were at a time where there was no Messenger, or no message that reached them. So Isa al Islam and his people were the messenger, uh, the messenger and the, the followers. But that continued for several generations without it being distorted. We don't know when it got distorted and changed, but you know, once again, that's another example of a distorted message. Now, all those people accountable during the time of the distorted message or at the time of no message, because sometimes you know, people don't reach or it dies out, even, um, you know, and kind of um, atheism kicks into society sometimes, right? It can happen. And nobody talks about beliefs. And this is what happens at the end of time. Prophet said there'll come a time when nobody knows. They'll say, we used to hear La ilaha illallah. They won't know what it means anymore, right? So end of time, there'll be no iman left. That's correct. Um, so those who don't have a warner, don't have a, a message, a revelation conveyed to them, then even if they did sins, uh, then they, according to this opinion, would be forgiven. And Aqab, Aqab uh, al-Aqabawi states that from the greatest of the people of Fitrah, so those who were in this time where uh, there was no revelation or no warning, no messenger, no accountability, are the parents of the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, they are in the greatest everlasting felicity. So just based on that opinion, we can say, no, we don't need, there's many hadith about this as well and all that kind of stuff. Their parents were brought alive, which some sort of scholars regard as sound, some regard as made up hadith. It's a big discussion, but just based on this very basic principle, majority of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, believe there's no accountability during a time of uh, no revelation. So that's no, not, not just the parents of the Prophet it's all the people at the time. And they may, we don't know what they were doing, but are they accountable or not? If they're not accountable, meaning they don't have a um, a, uh, a punishment, right? Then what is the other side of things? There's a reward. So the scholars actually discussed that. Those that don't have an accountability, they won't have a punishment because Allah is not unjust and unfair. But what will be their outcome? Will they get a reward? And Allah giving them a reward isn't being unfair to anybody else, but Allah, you know, because they didn't have that revelation and they didn't have the same life. So everybody's, you know, unique in their accountability or lack of it, right? So we can't compare in and say, oh, it's not fair. But will they get a reward though? What's the outcome of that? Some scholars said we don't have actually any um, actual um, sound, clear cut reports on what will happen. But uh, it has been mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test them on the day of judgment. Allah will give them tests on the day of judgment. If they pass those tests, they'll go to paradise. Okay, so that's what he's mentioned. Allah knows best what he will do with them. Um, but of course, we believe that, um, you know, Allah is just and fair and nobody will be punished for anything other than what they deserved. Um, it says it is worth mentioning that there are those who were from the people of Fitra, or the Fatra, to be honest, the people of this Fatra, this period of no um, revelation, uh, but whose abode is hellfire. So they're from this period, but you just said that, you know, they, they're all forgiven, they're not accountable, but they're from Hellfire. How? Because the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in hadith that due to their particular form of disbelief and kufarai and shirk, they are in the Hellfire, right? 
who are these people? He says, he mentioned Imrul Qais, the famous poet from the pre-Islamic era, and Hatim al are two people who are destined for hell, even though they exist in the period between the prophets. These are, however, me exceptions that have come to us on the tongue of prophecy, and we cannot use them to determine the fate of the people of, of Fattara, right? People of the time between prophets. Uh, Allah knows best, yeah? And then he actually mentions the Maturi opinion. Um, so, you know, I, Ashari's majority have said, and, and Matris, by the way, as well. So not all Matris, like we said before. Um, there, uh, we require revelation. Okay, here we don't require revelation. What, what's, what's that story? It says, according to Matris, however, the teaching of divine teaching is not a precondition because they, they said that Aqal alone is enough. They cause it necessary for every person to employ the intellect to reflect, ponder, and seek rational proof until one realizes that this world has one creator, just like the people of the cave, Ashab al-Kahf, Surah al-Kahf, did when they said, Our Lord is the Lord of the skies and the earth. And just like the Prophet Sallallahu Ibrahim did, Prophet Ibrahim reasoned with his people. He said, look, do we worship the sun, the moon, stars? No, these all go out. We worship God Almighty who doesn't ever disappear or go away. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, it has been reported that Imam Hanifa would say, there is no excuse for anyone in creation to be ignorant of their creator due to what one can see in the creation of the skies and earth in oneself and in all of creation. So Imam Hanifa, as you can see, uh, wouldn't come under the Maturidi opinion or Maturidi, but he's before that. He's 158H. Imam Maturidi passed away in 300 and something AH. But obviously, he has a similar kind of approach because this theology is the opinion of the ulama um, doctrine, uh, Aqidah. In the same manner, Imam al Baturi is also reported to have said the way to sacred law is by revelation. As for faith, the way to it is through the intellect, right? So, how do we get laws? We can't practice except by the salah. How do we get laws of fasting? The, the Sharia, the, the revelation Sharia, okay, beliefs, the Sharia lays down, the, the revelation lays down the beliefs, but we can get to a certain level of belief, i.e. by our intellect, intellects alone. So these are the opinions, like I said, the Akida here is the opinion of the scholars, meaning the opinions on these secondary issues. Like I said, ultimately, this doesn't affect our Iman, right? Us, we're accountable, right? We've been given the message, we know Islam, we have to believe. Is it dangerous for us not to believe now? We're looking here about people that have never come across Islam or Muslims or a faith and etc. And what we're saying is, what is their accountability, right? Ultimately, Allah is the account, one hold them to God. Allah is the one who holds to account. He's Sari al Hisab, right? It's His Hisab, it's not ours, right? We won't be uh, answering on behalf of anybody else, right? And nobody else will be answering on our behalf. We, we, we hope we get help because there's help available from the prophets and martyrs and pious. But, um, you know, we're not answerable for other people, right? So whatever happens to someone ultimately isn't our, um, uh, it's our concern, I've got to say that. But it's not our, um, uh, like, like what I'm talking about is people have gone. Once they've gone, they're gone. Right now, the concern should be for those who are living. The Prophet was extremely concerned for those who are living, Muslims and non-Muslims. He was always wanting them to believe because they'd met him. And that in itself is a big proof against them that you met my Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you, you spoke to him and then you didn't believe. Like that's the biggest proof in itself. And the prophets were sent as hujjatun. Allah said we sent messengers as hujja, as a proof and argument against people. So if somebody receives a message, then again, this supports the Ashari view as well, that once they've received the hujja, there's no argument against that. Halas, you can't argue against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent. He sent you clear proofs and arguments, uh, which will later on not allow you to argue back. Um, so this is you know a, an area of long discussion, but we'll move on to the fourth um, prerequisite of being a mukallaf, a responsible person, and that is uh, that one has to have sound senses, i.e. one of the two. So if you can hear, can't see, blindness isn't in, uh, just have hearing, that's you're accountable because you can communicate. If you can't hear but you can see, then you can communicate and you can learn through vision, you're accountable if the previous three conditions are fulfilled as well. It says the one who is both deaf and dumb and thus does not have the capacity to comprehend information is exempted and excused. However, if he is deaf, deaf only, can't hear only, or dumb, can't, uh, dumb I think is not the right word, he is deaf and blind. So it should be, it's, it's sight and not speech. So it should, this is, um, Allah Alam, um, just to make a note here, it's not about being able to speak or not, it's about being able to hear and see. So if you can hear uh, or you can see, one of the two, then you are accountable, right? Speech doesn't come into it. Whether you can speak or not isn't really about about it, right? Um, it's it's, it's not deaf, deaf or, unless dumb means you, know, you can't see, uh, but I don't think it does. If he is deaf only or blind only, then he is still considered to be a responsible person. So it's to do with sight and uh, hearing, not with sight and speech. Sight and hearing, deaf hearing and sight.
right? Uh, just make a note of that. That is important to, to make a note of, right? Okay, then it says the first obligation is to know him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so it says the first obligation with regards to belief is to actively know and have no sis of the existence of Allah and to know what is necessary, impossible and possible for him. Um, in a similar vein, in just a few points mentioned there, it is worth noting, however, that there are some debate with regards to this issue. So what is the first obligation, right? Um, and by the knowing here means to know the attributes of Allah with the proof. Ma'rifah, we should define it, maybe ma'rifah. Ma'rifah, which is the word used here, and what is used in this Iqida context, not in general context, um, is to know Allah, is to know something, to have ma'rifah something, and dalilin with the proof. Okay? Do we need to know Allah with the proof? And like I said, the proof can be a basic as there's a creation, there's, there's skies, there's trees, there's, you know, so many amazing things around us. There's got to be a creator. I believe in a creator. That's the proof. Right? That in itself is an argument, which is valid. It's a general argument. It's not specific. It's not detailed. But it's enough for one to become, have ma'rifa. Right? This is ma'rifa. Not just to say, because you know, if, you if you don't have any knowledge behind, so basically ma'rifa means knowing. So if you don't have knowledge behind what you believe, what you uh, hold on to, your aqidah, then it's called blind following. It's, you know, adhering to your the thoughts of your fathers and you know your culture and so forth you know you just need a basic level of i believe because of everything and that's you know what islam teaches as well fantastic right i know why i believe in things right and obviously you develop that further and further the more you study there's a basic level and there's an in-depth level a theology is not for everyone and we're not talking about the in-depth level we're talking about just the basics and we will talk actually we'll be talking about the in-depth as we go along inshallah um so is that the first obligation? Yes, it is. You know, this is the predominant opinion. And leaving it, therefore, not having a basic proof, which is very rare. Nobody's going to be like, I don't know why I believe in God. Just follow my dad. No, you know, there's a creation. I believe in God because he's the creator. Look at life itself. Look how things work. There's got to be a creator. And people say that. It's, it's this intrinsic feeling in us. That's enough when we feel that and, and look at everything around us and we come to that decision. Um, we all have to realize that. Once we have that that ma'rifah, that realization, job done. And we can move on to learning other things. It says, what does it mean to know? It says, knowing or having noises in Arabic because fact is commonly defined as an absolute certain belief which agrees with reality and supported by evidence. So he has to agree. He has to be the correct belief, of course. Um, but below we will take a deep look into each constant of this definition. So absolute certain belief. That means it can't be a doubtful thing. It can't be guesswork. It can't be anything like this. Marifat is considered 100% sound certainty. Agreement with reality. So if somebody has certainty in uh, Trinity and has got his so-called or her so-called proof for it, it doesn't make it Marifa. He has to agree with reality, which is Tawheed. Uh, which is Allah is all powerful. You know, somebody lives in two gods, or you know, a god of bad, a god of evil, or something like this, a god of dark, god of light. Then this is not in accordance with the reality in the actual correct beliefs. So it wouldn't be considered true ma'rifa. Uh, supported by evidence. So of course you could um, be inspired. You could feel the truth. You know, you could just uh, you know um, follow it, like I said, blindly follow it. So it's you're certain of it. It's agrees with the truth. So you got ma'rifa. No, you have to have a proof behind. You have to have a reasoning and knowledge behind this, right? Um, but it is considered um, belief if you do have uh, the correct faith and it agrees with the, the truth, right? It's called faith, but it's sinful. Why is it sinful? Because you haven't learnt it. You've just followed it from somebody else, but it's valid. So there are sinful believers just by just by not learning a basic level of Akida. And as we said, it's an obligation to learn Akida. If you don't learn Akida, learn Akida it's an obligation. Missing an obligation is a sin, so that you, you get a sin for that, right? Um, and that's what it talks about next. Is the, the above discussions bring us... Uh, to a very important issue of blind following in matters of faith, right? And to summarize that, like we said, if there's a simple and basic proof one has, then that takes one out of blind following. And there's absolutely no proof, just I follow, I don't know why, then that's considered sinful, but valid, and that's the most correct opinion. And then it moves on to those 20 attributes which we discussed or necessary for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we talk about that we'll talk about first of all why we're going to go through 20 um, and we're going to categorize the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we're going to talk about the concept of a rational necessary um, concept we're going to talk about a rationally um, impossible concept or inconceivable we're going to talk about things which are customary so we're going to talk about the three uh, ahkam and right, we did this in our muqaddimat as sanusiyah so if you want to refer back to the first few lessons of that, we covered this already, and we're going to do it briefly here. We're not going to go into it too much depth. 
because that's a precursory discussion we've had before in our Muqaddimat series. But it's mentioned here as well as part of this book, so we will touch on it. And then we'll move after, you know, understanding the three um, rational judgments. Something is necessary, something is impossible, something is possible. What is necessary for Allah? We're going to go through those 20 attributes. What is therefore impossible and then what's possible, etc. We'll be talking about. Uh, and then they get into the actual attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in next lesson. Inshallah ta'ala. So we'll stop here um, at this stage where it says, It is necessary for Allah to have, we I, logically, rationally, we must believe in 20 attributes for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are, and then he mentions the ones we read last time, from his existence to his pre-eternalness to his same paternity, as it's mentioned there, um, to his being different from creation, otherness, etc. These whole, uh, these attributes we'll discuss. And we'll also talk about what the meanings of the attributes are and how they refer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what names correspond with those attributes from the 99 names of Allah and so forth. So thank you very much for being a part of today's class. Um, Jazakumullah khairan. We'll just go to the questions, see if there are any, and we'll um, finish inshallah. Wa alaikum assalam to everyone. Says there are stories that say Ismail Alam has been used by many to do supernatural works. Are those true? I don't know. Um, there's many narrations about Ismail Alam and what happens and so forth. Allah knows best how how Ismail Alam works. I don't have access to that knowledge. I'm sorry. It says what? Uh, so what about those hadith which condemn asking for post or rulership, governorship? Um, yeah, that's that's in general. Okay, so I think that's referring to Yusuf alayhi salam. Um, so he asked for a leadership post. It's, it's good. You should ask for leadership post when it's actually the right thing to do. And harm is going to come if somebody else gets into power. You're not asking for leadership. You're asking to protect from harm. So Yusuf al-Islam knew that if he doesn't get that post, what's going to happen? It's going to not destroy his country, Egypt, but it's going to destroy a lot of other people who are going to come for help. So he was trying to avert a calamity by taking that role. So if you, it's a judgment you have to make. If you see that uh, something is actually going to be really bad, then you should go forward for something, right? Um, and you should you should take that role. The not wanting leadership is a good trait, and you shouldn't you know want to take leadership um, when there's no need to. Right? Uh, let, let let it come to you without seeking it. Right? That's the hadith. Um, it says, what about any using for anybody any of the attributes names of Allah without using alif lam at the beginning? Can we say because some? No, we can't. So we can't say Rahman or Ar Rahman. Both of them are not allowed. We can't use them in any way, so we can't use them like so. Allah can't use it. Says you can't use Rahman as with alif lam or with idafa. We can't use uh, samad with alif lam or with idafa. So samadu, al, you know, you can't use anything like that. The word rabb you can. So rabb is one of those words which you can't use as ar rabb with alif lam or with for Allah subhanahu wa taala. But the word ar rabb specifically, you can use with idafa. It's used to say rabbul bait, the, the 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 head of the house or rabbatul bait. You know, um, rabbu fula. So rabb is used in a sense of leader. A nurturer, head of, right? But not the names Ar Rahman, Ar Samad. They're not used with Alif Lam or without Alif Lam and so forth. Other names are, so these two we've said are specific and unique, not only these few. Um, other names are, so you can have Ar Rauf, Ar Rahim, Ar Sami, Al Basir, Al Alim. You know, these can be used with Al and without Al uh, as attributes of creation. Ar <clears throat> Rajul Al Karim. So Al Karim is not here a name of Allah. Ar Rajul Al Karim means the noble man. It's used in everyday language by Arabs all over the world. Um, it's perfectly fine. So these are just normal attributes of are used in a common day language. They're fine. But the words as samad is never used for a human, and nor, nor can they be used in the in without the alif lam. Um, it says, will this be the same in this world today when people can learn about Islam in the right manner if she tries a bit? As much as wise, but that's what I said. If you wanna, I'll, I'll, I'll try and find the name of that book, and and you can read into that topic yourselves. But in terms of you know how much knowledge you need to have, awareness of Islam, this the media now and the communication and internet and all this does how does it impact that like i said it's allah's decision not ours uh but you know this book will probably give you a, a lot more guidelines of what imam ghazali said anyway he says will those person be punished for not trying to know like, i don't know you know that's up to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um you know we all have to figure out what to do in life and obviously there's a purpose people search for some people don't search for it will they be accountable um you know uh, allah knows best uh you know if they haven't received a warning and they haven't received the message they won't be and i don't know if they have yet or they haven't and what Allah will decide regarding them so like I said it's not something we are held accountable we should be concerned for it and I, I did mention that um, but we can't control it you know we can't uh, decide the ultimate outcome of someone but we pray for everyone's well and this is the why we should make for everyone so it must be anonymous for guidance you know asking for guidance is one of the best du'as you can make for someone um, and it's the du'a we should be making for non-believers, right? So you, you might hear, oh, you can't make du'a for non-believers, they, they're not believers, you know. It's prohibited, the Prophet was prohibited from this, and he was indeed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in 
against the munafiqun, the hypocrites. But there's nothing stopping us from making dua for their guidance, which is part of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and the Quran calls for that. Pray for the guidance of people and the well-being that will lead them to guidance, right? So, uh, you know, we should pray they try to know and try to know the truth. Uh, and you, you'd be surprised who believes when you make dua for them and you have a good opinion towards them and you make efforts towards them, uh, inshallah ta'ala. Thank you very much for today. Jazakumullah khairan. Hopefully you're all doing well and see you next lesson. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.